When Maxwell's equations were all set in stone and people considered classical electrodynamics to be complete, there were still some contradictions which people could not resolve. As it turned out, these were not just some minor inconveniences, but a completely new theory was developed by Albert Einstein to resolve these issues. The theory of special relativity. I would like to show one of these contradictions that arises in classical electrodynamics if one does not use special relativity and how it is easily resolved within the framework of special relativity. Now to begin, consider a uniform conductor of infinite length and vanishing diameter. It is not electrically charged, that means if we freeze time in every section of the conductor we're going to find an equal number of electrons and ions with a single positive charge. The conductor does carry a current, however, so the electrons move with a certain velocity, and parallel to the conductor, at some distance r, a single electron moves with the same velocity. So what now happens is that the current causes a magnetic field, and any charged particle which moves in a magnetic field is going to experience a force acting on it. And that force is perpendicular to both the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field. For this example, it points towards the conductor. Now the first thing we need is the absolute value of that force. Since this is a textbook example, I'll go through this quickly. We start with the equation for the curl of the magnetic field and scratch the time derivative of the electric field since it is zero. And we know from vector calculus that the curl of some vector field integrated over some surface is the same as the vector field integrated over the border of the surface, which means that we can express the integral of b along a circle around the conductor via an integral of the current density over the cross section of the conductor. Since b and ds are always parallel, we simply get the absolute value of b times the circumference of the circle on the one side and mu zero times the current on the other side. Solving for b and plugging this into the formula for the Lorentz force yields the absolute value of f, e times v times mu naught times i over 2r pi. Now consider a shift of our frame of reference, which special relativity is all about, to the rest frame of the exterior electron. Here the electrons in the conductor stand still, while the ions are now moving around. So there is a current, and therefore a magnetic field, but the exterior electron is not moving. So V cross B is zero this time. But there needs to be a force towards the conductor. It is an absolutely reasonable assumption that if the electron moves towards the conductor in one frame of reference, it needs to do so in all frames of reference. The only way a charged body at rest can move in classical electrodynamics is through an electric field. In the previous frame of reference, the conductor was neutral. How on earth can there be an electric charge now? This is resolved by special relativity in a wonderful, wonderful way, which is length contraction. There are plenty of resources to learn about length contraction, but in essence, it means that a moving object looks shorter to an observer who is stationary than to an observer who is moving along with the object. This also applies to our conductor and in effect's charge density. If you consider the positive ions mounted on a stick and you send that stick moving and the distance between ions is contracted, the positive charge density increases. This is what happens when transitioning from the first frame of reference to the one we are considering right now. For the negative charges, the opposite is true, since they were moving at first and are now at rest, so they get spaced out a little more. So in total, there is an excess positive charge in the rest frame of the electron that pulls the electron towards the conductor. This length contraction is quantified by a factor called Lorentz factor, written as gamma. For now, all I want to say is that it is a number greater or equal to 1 that allows to compare lengths in different frames of reference. So L in the rest frame becomes L over gamma in the moving frame, 
or L in the moving frame becomes gamma L in the rest frame. That means that our charge density, when compared to the previous frame of reference, is multiplied by gamma for the positive charge and divided by gamma for the negative charge. To express that, we write lambda plus prime equals gamma lambda plus and lambda minus prime equals lambda minus over gamma. Primed quantities are descriptions within the second frame of reference, the rest frame of the electron, with which we are dealing right now. And lambda is a symbol I chose for the line charge density, in other words, charge per unit length. In the previous frame of reference, it was true that lambda plus equals minus lambda minus, which is I over V. So positive and negative line charge had the same absolute value and opposite signs, since the conductor was neutral. But now in the rest frame, there's a net charge lambda prime, which equals lambda plus prime plus lambda minus prime, which is I over V times gamma minus one over gamma. The next step is to compute the electric field of a uniform line charge, which is again a textbook example and pretty straightforward. The electric field of a uniform line charge is a radially outward pointing vector, which is clear from its symmetry. And since the divergence of E is equal to the charge density over epsilon naught, and the divergence of any vector field integrated over some volume, is equal to the vector field integrated over the border of that volume, we can think of some cylinder with radius r around the conductor and the charge density integrated over the volume will be equal to epsilon naught times the E field at distance r from the conductor integrated over the surface. Now the left side simply gives all the charge within the cylinder, which for a cylinder of length L is lambda times L. For the right side, we can ignore the two bases of the cylinder, since the field is parallel to them. So E dA would give zero, and we only consider the mantle, where E and dA are parallel, so we simply get the absolute value of E times the area of the mantle, which is 2R pi times L. This yields the absolute value of the electric field at distance R, and I'm adding primes again, because we now would like to apply this to the primed frame of reference. The absolute value of the electrostatic force is E times E, so fundamental charge times the absolute value of the electric field. So we have an expression for the absolute value of the force in the prime frame of reference, and we can insert our expression for lambda prime, which relates it back to quantities of the unprimed frame of reference. Now there is a final catch that we have to be careful about. We cannot simply equate F prime and F. They are the forces that observe us in the unprimed and primed frame of reference C acting on the electron. But like different observers report different lengths of the same object, they also perceive forces differently. The forces are perpendicular to the relative velocity that separates our frames of reference, so length contraction cannot play a role in that. So why are the forces different? It has to do with time dilation, and it will turn out that F prime equals gamma F. It is actually not hard to show why forces behave like that, but this video is long enough as it is, so you gotta believe me that F prime equals gamma F. Now all that's left to do is equate the forces and sneak that additional gamma in and solve for gamma. The only interesting thing that happens here is that epsilon naught mu naught is 1 over c squared, which is part of Maxwell's theory, and we get an expression for gamma. If we look it up, we see that it is precisely correct, so everything worked out as it should. And if you keep in mind that special relativity can be derived without ever looking at Maxwell's equations, but it still gets to solve all the contradictions associated with them, it is quite remarkable, and a beautiful piece of physics.